When you think of the term crime drama, what comes to mind? Do you think of Roger Daltrey screaming over a picturesque Miami backdrop? Or maybe a certain pair of iconic percussive clunks? Or maybe your mind drifts to the streets of New York. Mafia gangsters, pinstripe suits, Tommy guns. Or maybe you begin to picture a dilapidated RV parked in the middle of the New Mexican desert. Whether it's a procedural drama, a western, a whodunit, or even true crime, our media often paints crime as something extraordinary, in that it is beyond the ordinary, taking place in a reality divorced from typical civilized society. Although crime is a relatively uncommon thing in most of our day-to-day lives, especially violent crime, it's still an extremely pervasive fascination in our media, bordering on obsession. Crime can take many forms. It can be downright evil, mysterious, suspenseful, horrific, addictive, chaotic, cathartic, high stakes, menacing, self-destructive, or even sexy and badass, i.e. anything but dull. And as you can see, crime in its many forms really runs the gamut in terms of all the genres and subgenres that it touches. Honestly, if you're looking for a way to spice up a screenplay, adding some sort of criminal element does the trick a lot of the time. Rarely, though, do you see crime painted like this. Stripped down, mundane, even kind of pathetic? This isn't some high-octane action scene from a heist film. It's just a guy trying to get his bike back. And even though, on the surface, exhibiting crime this way seems awfully pedestrian, this film taught me more about crime than any of the other movies and TV shows I referenced just a minute ago. Now you're probably wondering, all right, 1C2, you've hyped this up long enough, what's the name of the movie? Bicycle Thieves. The movie is called Bicycle Thieves or Ladri di Biciclette if you're in a particularly Italian mood, directed by Vittorio De Sica. The movie takes place in 1948, in a tattered Rome, recovering from the physical, political, and economic scars of World War II. All of it is filmed on location. A quintessential work from the Italian neorealist movement, Bicycle Thieves set out to capture the everyday experiences of working people in post-war Italy. The good, yes, but particularly the bad and the ugly. Poverty, exploitation, injustice, desperation. Hell, even the actors themselves were mostly amateurs. Non-professional actors, local to the area, who had probably lived or seen similar stories firsthand. Lamberto Maggirani, who plays the lead Antonio Ricci, was himself just a factory worker. Enzo Staiola, who plays Antonio's son, Bruno, was helping his real-life father sell flowers on the street near where the production was filming. The plot is remarkably simple. The film's protagonist, Antonio Ricci, is a working-class man struggling to provide for his wife and two kids. After a prolonged stint of unemployment, through sheer luck, Antonio lands a job as a bill poster. However, there's a catch. The job requires him to own a bicycle. Hearing this, Antonio's wife decides to sell her dowry sheets, one of the few valuables the family has left, in order to buy back Antonio's bicycle from the pawn shop. But just when things were looking up for Antonio and his family, his bicycle is stolen on his first day on the job. The thief gets away with the bike, and the police tell Antonio that there's practically nothing they can do. It's just a bicycle, after all. The rest of the movie follows Antonio and his son Bruno as they try to surmount the near impossible task of finding this lost bicycle somewhere along the streets of Rome. A real needle in a haystack. After exhaustively looking for the bicycle all day, and just when things were beginning to get grim, Antonio has another miraculous stroke of luck. 
He and his son just happen to run into the bicycle thief on the street, who we learn is named Vittorio. After Antonio chases Vittorio down and threatens him to return his stolen bicycle, Vittorio's mother and Vittorio's neighbors come out onto the street to defend him. He's a good kid with a clean record, his mother asserts. In the midst of all this, Bruno runs off to grab a police officer, who breaks things up with his presence. He then advises Antonio that if he did decide to press charges against Vittorio, he would have no case. Antonio has no witnesses, the bicycle is still nowhere to be found, and Vittorio's neighbors would be certain to provide a convincing alibi. Feeling dejected, Antonio storms off. Narratively, this moment is incredibly powerful. Despite Antonio doing everything right, everything he's supposed to, and getting extremely lucky multiple times on top of that, he is still ultimately defeated. He has exhausted all possible avenues of getting his bike back. The one thing he needs to keep his job. The key to providing a good life for his family and escaping the poverty they've known for so long. It's hard not to let yourself imagine what life would be like for this family if things turned out a little differently. With the money from Antonio's new job, the Ricci's could buy back their sheets, patch the holes in their clothes, buy new clothes. Bruno, who works as a mechanic at a gas station, could quit his job and have a proper childhood. They could afford to eat out at restaurants more often, rubbing shoulders with those fancy folk who turned their noses up at them earlier in the story. It's a life of unprecedented comfort and possibility. After his altercation with Vittorio and his neighbors, Antonio comes to a crossroads, both a literal and metaphorical one. Does he take the high road, turn the other cheek, and pray that he lands upon another job that pays as well? Or, feeling spited by the world, does he seek out justice in one last way, by taking from the streets of Rome what the streets of Rome had stolen from him? After heavy contemplation, Antonio tells Bruno to catch the trolley, and that he'll meet back up with him at a later stop. Antonio then darts off around a street corner. There, an unaccompanied bicycle waits on the side of an empty street. It's framed almost as if the thing is taunting him, as if it were divinely placed to entice Antonio. And uh, since the title of the film is Bicycle Thieves and not Bicycle Thief, I think you can guess what happens next. After some hesitation, Antonio rips the bike from the wall and speeds off. Immediately, the bicycle's owner and other locals start chasing him down. But Antonio isn't fast enough. Eventually, he's dragged to the ground and endlessly berated for his theft. And even worse, Bruno missed the tram. He saw the entire thing. Bruno breaks into the crowd, grabbing his father, pulling on his jacket with tears in his eyes. The bicycle's owner, seeing Bruno distraught at the thought of his father being thrown into jail, takes pity on them. He lets Antonio go free. The father-son duo then tread the long walk home, clasping each other's hands, each of them in a daze. Roll credits. The ending to this movie is heartbreaking to watch, to say the least, but it's also absolutely masterful cinema. All of the film's thematic strings are beautifully tied together in the space of only a few minutes. And we learn that this is a film about many things. For one, this is a film about emasculation, about how the modern expectations of manhood and fatherhood are violently enforced in society, about how their internal contradictions make it difficult to parse out what a good man is or should be, and about how weakness and failure are ceaselessly punished in society. Stealing the bicycle was an act of both public and personal shame for Antonio, which is why he didn't want Bruno there to see it. And that also wasn't the first time he lied to his family to save face. Antonio is obviously motivated by deep love for his family, aspirations of becoming the family's breadwinner, and a burning desire to escape unemployment and poverty, which are emasculating in their own right. And there's also the fact that it's a little awkward that his son, a literal child, works at a petrol station to help support the family, while Antonio has struggled to do the same. But 
he also recognizes that stealing a bicycle to solve all this also exudes desperation, shows that he can't fix this issue on his own without resorting to illegal means. And it's even worse if he gets caught, because then both the act and its execution demonstrate his perceived weakness as a man and as a father, which then further frays his relationship to society and to his own son. And that's exactly what happens. You're a fine example for your son, says one of Antonio's captors sarcastically. You should be ashamed. This is also a film about systemic and cyclical injustice, about how modern institutions fail individuals. When his bicycle is stolen originally, the police do next to nothing to help Antonio, and the only people that he has to depend on to help him are his friends and his family. Not some mystic soothsayer, not the government, and not the church. And yet, no amount of hard work or dedication, no amount of bootstrapping yourself, and no amount of luck can save you from abject poverty in the face of systemic societal failures. It's inescapable. It's absolutely ludicrous that something as simple as a bicycle was the key to the Ricci family's survival. When Bruno sees his dad get wrestled to the ground, he potentially gets a glimpse into his own future. In an instant, he loses his characteristic naivete as he internalizes just how serious his family situation is, realizing that his father would risk jail time in order to keep his job. Unless something drastic changes, one day he might even be walking in his father's shoes, forced to adopt desperate means for the sake of survival. This moment marks Bruno's loss of, well, whatever innocence he still had left in him. And lastly, this is a film about crime. Too often, crime is characterized as explicitly and universally an evil thing. Its existence, we're told, is a stain on civilized society, and we hear all about how the cure typically lies in instilling moral righteousness in citizens and doubling down on law enforcement. But Bicycle Thieves shows us this isn't really how crime works, or at least not all crime. Whereas crime is usually painted as a selfish act in media, Antonio's actions are anything but. In his mind, he has no choice. Other coercive elements of society outside of his control have forced him into this dilemma. In the end, he sacrifices himself and his pride for a chance at a good life for those he loves. While some in the film reactively throw blame at Antonio for what he does, we, as the audience, can only empathize. This is why I absolutely love Bicycle Thieves. Bicycle Thieves is a masterful sociological exploration of crime, rather than an outright denunciation or fetishization of it. It's fundamentally about good people who are driven to do quote-unquote bad things, and why they do them. While society at large may view Antonio's crimes as personal failings, the film vehemently rejects this framing. Instead, crime in Bicycle Thieves signifies societal needs that are being insufficiently met. One moment in the film that I find really interesting is when Antonio and the police officer search Vittorio's house for the bicycle, and we discover that Vittorio has a lot more in common with Antonio than we initially think. Up until this point in the story, Vittorio and his accomplices are sort of othered by Antonio, treated more like prey rather than actual people. At some points, you begin to wonder whether Antonio cares more about getting revenge on Vittorio than he does about getting the actual bike back. But visiting Vittorio's home is a very cleansing and humanizing moment. Like Antonio and his family, Vittorio's family too is struggling to get by. We see that Vittorio's family also lives in a crummy apartment, and we hear Vittorio's mom mention how Vittorio can't find a job. I really enjoy how the film seems to suggest that, while our natural instinct may be to pit ourselves against one another, honestly, the real culprit is the system that put Vittorio and Antonio into their situations in the first place. Contrary to what you might expect of a story about working class people though, Bicycle Thieves doesn't really feel like an explicit critique of capitalism, at least not in my experience watching it. Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, for example, famously ends with an explicit call for worker solidarity and drastic political reform. 
Such a message, at least overtly, is notably absent from Bicycle Thieves. All in all, it's more of a lament than a critique. Socialists do make a small appearance in the film, though, right after Antonio loses his bike, but their inclusion feels almost incidental. They're just background noise, window dressing, not really taken that seriously by the main characters. Because of all this, the movie feels unfinished, in a way. Unresolved. There's no payoff to Antonio's struggle. Only disappointment. But I suppose that's the entire point of the movie. Sometimes in life, that's just how it is. And good art doesn't tell, it shows. The final shot of the film shows the backs of Antonio and Bruno walking into the crowded Roman streets. Their silhouettes slowly becoming obfuscated and then lost altogether in the sea of pedestrians. In this moment, we recognize that their story is just one of many. I think the message of the film, then, is not one of prescriptive political action. Instead, it's to internalize the idea that every one of these people faced the same anxieties and pressures as the film's main characters do, and as we do. Our compassion, then, shouldn't lay exclusively with Antonio and Bruno just because we happen to be acquainted with their backstory, but rather with humankind more broadly. Only once we all embrace such a universal compassion and imagination can we then begin to think about improving our world. After Bicycle Thieves finished production, Lamberto Maggirani, who again played Antonio in the story, went back to work at a factory. But he was soon laid off from his job. Management needed to implement a few budget cuts, and they thought that since Majirani had become such a big shot movie star, that it would be more fair to fire him than any of his other struggling co-workers. Of course, Majirani hadn't made millions as his bosses alleged. He made only 600,000 lire from his work on Bicycle Thieves, equivalent to about 1,000 US dollars at the time. And he used that money to buy some new furniture for his family and to take them on a vacation. While he continued to work on and off as an actor throughout the years, nothing he touched would ever reach the same level of eminence as Bicycle Thieves, his first movie. A simple story about a man trying to make his way in the world, trying to do right by his family, and being punished for it. Sometimes, it's really hard to tell if art imitates life, or if life, in fact, imitates art. This has been 1C2. Thanks for watching.